Hello. Hello, good morning, Hello. Demer. Hello, good morning. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I hope that you are all fine. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Good and, and ready yes. for today. Okay. So uh, we are live uh, and uh, it's 9.20 according to my clock. So we should start. Uh, I would like to, uh, on behalf of all the project team, uh, welcome all the participants on uh, today's uh, workshop, uh, which deals mostly uh, on uh, material modeling for uh, advanced additive manufacturing. Uh, at the beginning, I would like to show you a few, uh, first of all, our timetable, uh, but I have to share my screen. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Tomislav, please help. <laughs> okay. So here we have We have not, not this, not this, not this. So here you can see our today timetable. At the beginning, I will tell you uh, a few things about the project, about our recent activities and a few uh, future activities. And then we will start with lectures. I hope that we can maintain our timetable, but uh, uh, please forgive us if we will be a little bit out of, of this uh, very short time for each presentation because the authors prepared really interesting uh, information and uh, uh, and presentations and uh, maybe half an hour is not uh, enough to show all the things that uh, they are very important in, in their area. Uh, so... Uh, I would like to, I would like to show some uh, some basic facts about the about the project. It's uh, the full name is Increasing Excellence on Advanced Additive Manufacturing, and uh, this is the acronym in Exadam. Uh, we started at uh, uh, September 2018, and uh, the plan was to finish on September. Uh, 2021, but I'm not sure that we will make it. Uh, we will try to do it, but uh, if not, we will ask the uh, European Commission for prolonging the project. This is a budget. Uh, Faculty of uh, Mechanical Engineering and now Architecture is a uh, coordinator of the project, and this is the web page of the uh, project. Uh, uh, the main idea in this project is uh, for us, for Faculty of Mechanical Engineering, to get uh, advanced knowledge from certain areas of uh, application of additive manufacturing, and we decided to learn from the best. And uh, here you can see the list uh, of our partners, uh, Lund University from Sweden, uh, Brunel University from London, Motan University from uh, Leoben, and uh, Institute IDIME from Valencia. So uh, we are a quite small uh, consortium, but very, very compact, and we have a really good cooperation uh, during this project. Uh, there are some of the objectives of the, our project. First of all, we try to uh, strengthen the synergy among uh, the whole institutions uh, that are participating in this project. Then we would like to gather more uh, knowledge and more uh, uh, expertise in, in, in uh, some uh, specific topics which are dedicated to advanced design for additive manufacturing for uh, then uh, uh, and products uh, in, in uh, uh, tooling sector in uh, medical sector and we would like to have uh, uh, more knowledge from uh, material modeling for additive manufacturing and of course, we would like to be more uh, visible, not only uh, Center for Additive Technologies from our faculty, but also the whole partners on, on a global, global uh, scene. Uh, our project was uh, developed, uh, divided in a few work packages. 
and maybe for us uh, the most important one is the rising knowledge uh, and excellence but uh, today's uh, today's activity is uh, uh, dedicated to the work package four because after we are reaching this knowledge uh, we have to share it with uh, with the uh, potential uh, users of uh, additive manufacturing and all uh, of the audience that is interested in, in this uh, uh, area. So uh, we visit, uh, visited in, in past uh, more than one year uh, all the partners, their facilities and learn a lot from uh, their field of expertise. So we were in, in uh, Montana visiting Leoben in Austria and learn how to uh, how to develop a new materials uh, for uh, additive manufacturing. Uh, the experts from Brunel University were in, in Zagreb and they te uh, um, uh, teach us uh, uh, some facts about standardization in additive manufacturing as well as functional grade additive materials. Uh, something more will be told uh, in, in their presentation today. Uh, also, we visited the uh, uh, institute in uh, Spain, in, in Valencia, IDEME, and there we learned how to create a new uh, material, a powder material for uh, metal additive manufacturing, uh, what is the procedure of characterization of such material, and we have the opportunity to see electron beam melting and SLS technologies. And all, uh, at the end uh, of the year, uh, we were uh, in Sweden and learned uh, more about the design for IT manufacturing, some advanced techniques for design optimization, like topology optimization, generative design, and so on. Uh, we started the, the, this year with, uh, with a workshop uh, in, in February, where the main topic was advanced uh, design and application of IT manufacturing. And uh, our our idea was to, to proceed with a uh, uh, few workshops and, and summer schools, uh, uh, but the Corona uh, virus uh, changed our plans. So uh, today we have, uh, unfortunately, online workshop and uh, there are some uh, future activities uh, also that will be held probably online the first two uh, certainly online. Uh, the first one is a workshop innovative, innovative business model for additive manufacturing uh, that was organized by our partners from Brunel University. But this is a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, uh, closed uh, because uh, you have to be registered on Design 2020 conference in order to be able to participate in this uh, workshop. Uh, a, a few days later, uh, next week on, on Thursday. We also will have a, a summer school on advanced additive manufacturing uh, for design and, and materials. And this is open and you are all welcome to, to uh, sign uh, up for uh, this, uh, this event. Also, we will we'll, uh, organize in the future workshop and summer school for medical uh, sector. I hope until the end of the 2020, but maybe at the beginning uh, of 2021. I'm not sure uh, at this moment. Also, we established recently uh, Adam Platform, which can be found on our webpage. Our webpage is on the first slide. Uh, and uh, through this platform, uh, the whole consortium uh, will be able to provide a certain type of ser uh, services, uh, the knowledge transfer, research, and uh, cooperation in future products for all interested uh, partners. So uh, you have to register on our web uh, site to the platform, and then uh, we can discuss about future activities uh, in our cooperation. Uh, also, uh, we recently uh, published the uh, Advanced Data Manufacturing Handbook in form of deliverable for European Commission. But now we will be in the process of uh, preparing this uh, handbook for uh, publication in, in uh, open access uh, form. And um, some of the main topics uh, are presented here in, in, in this slide. So uh, this is uh, just uh, a few facts. These are just a few facts about the project, uh, so I will not uh, take uh, too much time more. Uh, uh, for uh, any further question, uh, uh, 
I think that uh, it's the best to contact me at my email and I'm uh, available at the page of the uh, faculty or the, the page of the project. So my contacts are there. And uh, for any, any further question, please do not hesitate to, to contact me. Uh, and uh, just a few words before we are starting with the, our workshop. Uh, 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 because we are uh, at the webinar mode uh, in in this uh, this situation, uh, the uh, participants of this workshop uh, do not have a possibility to put a question directly online. So please, if you have a question, you can write it in the form of question and answers. You have a, a button at the bottom of the screen. And you can uh, press this button and put a question to the presenter. And the presenter can decide whether uh, he, she or he will answer uh, immediately or at the end of uh, it, uh, his presentation uh, or her presentation. Uh, after the end of this uh, 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 workshop, uh, we will prepare at our web page a uh, recorded uh, version of this uh, workshop because this workshop is, is recorded and uh, all of the participants uh, who will not be uh, today all the time with us or uh, uh, if uh, someone couldn't make it uh, can download the, the, the uh, recorded version of the workshop and uh, also uh, for if someone will uh, request uh, PDF form of presentations uh, today, uh, from today's workshop, uh, they can ask me uh, with a request uh, and uh, we will prepare uh, this PDF and send to all the uh, interested participants. This is so far from me from the beginning and uh, according to my, uh, my uh, timetable, the first presenter is uh, Ivica Juretek from uh, Institute uh, Montan, uh, Montan University in Leoben, uh, Department for Polymer Processing. And uh, as you can see here, he will speak about determination, uh, material data determination of polymer processing, uh, which is uh, very important for preparing a new material uh, for any kind of uh, polymer processing. And uh, in this case, we will speak about uh, mostly FFF technologies and maybe uh, in, in one of the next lectures about uh, injection molding. Injection molding is not uh, additive manufacturing uh, technology, but uh, also uh, this is uh, very interesting to see how you can simulate uh, this, uh, this type of project. So, uh, Ivica, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Damir. Um, I should... Un 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 uh -huh who can share, all panelists. So, I hope you can see the presentation, the first slide. Yes, it's okay. visible. Perfect. Okay, before I start, let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Ivica Juretek, since uh, 1992, I work in uh, at Institute for Polymer Processing in Leoben at Montan University, and I'm responsible actually for material data determination in polymer processing. And this is actually the topic of my presentation today. Uh, after short introduction, I will explain why is the material data, uh, why, why are the material data important for computer aided modeling or simulation and for, for polymer processing? Then I will present some measurement techniques and equipment in the field of the viscosity measurement, PVT, thermoconductivity, and specific heat, heat. And at the end, I will present you some short examples. I must say for this presentation, we have, I have only 30 minutes time. I can actually, I can talk more than two hours. Uh, the printed uh, presentation 
in PDF form has more than 60 slides. I have reduced uh, the presentation. That means after the presentation, you can ask me every time using the email or today if something is not clear or if you have additional questions. Okay, everybody knows that for successfully products, you need first of all design construction, you need an idea, then you need, you must choose the material which will be used for the product and you must have the processing machine independent of the type of the processing, injection, molding, extrusion, or the additive manufacturing. And, and of course, you must mastering the process and the properties of material and all these steps in the design and the development. Uh, if you use the 3D simulation for injection molding or extrusion, you can optimize the polymer process the simulation can help you to avoid the design typical processing problems. And for the 3D simulation, actually you need the accurate, also the, the good material data. And this um, accurate simulation res results are influenced by machine parameters, by material, by fillers, and uh, with the quality of the material data. That means if you have the bad material data, you can have the good uh, simulation program, but the results will be bad. You will have the garbage at the end. And the next question is, where can I find the material data and which data I need for the flow simulation, for example, in the injection molding? We need the rheological data, the thermal data, mechanical data. All these data are necessary for the injection molding of the whole, of the simulation of the whole injection molding process. In the field of extrusion and uh, FFF or fused filament fabrication, important is viscosity, thermoconductivity, specific heat, and the density. And how you can get the material data. No? Uh, you can use the free material databases, for example, Campus or Polymath Free or Kern. All, in all these databases, you will not find all the materials which exist or which are available on the market. You can find some data at uh, by the material producers, or you can measure uh, by testing laboratories. If you pay for the measurement, for example, uh, in Leoben, we make all this measurement. If uh, the measurements are not, if are they expensive, or if you cannot pay for this, you can visit the other laboratories. Or and. If you have the commercial material databases in difficult in simulation programs like CAT mold, Moldex 3D, or SigmaSoft, you can find you can find some material data of not of all materials, but a lot of. I told on the beginning that the viscosity or and the flow properties are very important for the flow simulation. The question is, what is the viscosity? And viscosity is definite uh, like the resistance to the flow. And the most, this is the most used material parameter uh, when they're determining the flow behavior during the polymer processing or in additive manufacturing. This is the equation or definition of the viscosity is very simple. Uh, shear stress divided by shear rate. Uh, in this slide, you can see the typical uh, viscosity curve of the polymers. Uh, 
And in the range of the low shear rates, we have so-called Newtonian, Newtonian region. It means that the viscosity is independent of the shear rate. And in the range of the higher shear rate, we have so-called power low region and between is a, a transition region. And all polymers shows so-called pseudoplastic behavior. That means with increasing of the shear rate, the viscosity will be decreased. Uh, for the measurement of the viscosity, uh, at the market exist a lot of uh, rheometa types, uh, for example, capillary rheometas and rotational rheometas. And these capillary rheometas are divided to the laboratory devices or machine rheometers. Uh, for example, laboratory devices are high pressure capillary rheometer or melt flow rate or melt volume rate machine. And if we installed um, rheological device on the machine, we can have the injection molding rheometer or extrusion rheometer. And the typical rotation rheometer are plate plate, cone and plate, or coaxial cylinders depend on the testing geometry. Uh, today I will not explain and show all these devices. I will talk of, of only about important uh, devices like capillary rheometer and rotation rheometer. Uh, the typical shear rate ranges depends on the processing are uh, displayed in this slide. For example, the compression molding shear rate. So for the compression molding, the shear rate shear rates range is up to uh, 10 reciprocal seconds in extrusion. We have uh, shear rates depends on the volt thickness and volume rate between for example, 10 and 1,000 reciprocal seconds, and ejection molding up to 1 million, for example, and very high um, shear rates in the field of the fiber spinning. Of course, we cannot measure all these shear rates uh, with one rheometer. Um, rotational rheometer is recommended, for example, uh, dependent of the uh, shearing type uh, up to shear rates of 500 reciprocal second, uh, seconds. Extrusion rheometer uh, with this machine, we can realize slightly higher uh, shear rate range uh, over the thousand. And using the high pressure capillary rheometer, we can realize up to 100,000 reciprocal seconds. And if you use the injection molding machine, of course, depends on the size of the machine. It's possible to realize the shear rates higher than 1 million reciprocal seconds. This is important if you produce, for example, uh, very thin wall uh, injection molded parts. Uh, for example, the credit cards or uh, housing of the mobile phones. In the additive manufacturing, the shear rates are in the range between 10 minus 1 and uh, approximately 1,000 reciprocal second. OK. The high pressure capillarometer, uh, if you use this uh, device, we can use two different uh, geometries, round and slit die. And We have one electrical heated barrel, and in this, uh, after the barrel, at the end of the barrel, we can install the round die or the slit die. And the, using the piston, the, in, the molded material will be pushed through the capillary and extrudate. Uh, during the extrusion, we can measure the uh, pressure in inlet of the capillary and using the slit die, you can measure the pressure propagation along the capillary. Yeah, 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 yeah. Using the geometry and the uh, pressure, uh, measured pressure, 
it's very easy to calculate the shear stress and then viscosity. Uh, in this slide, you can see the two, two high-pressure capillary rheometers in our lab. Uh, we use different capillaries, round capillaries with different diameters and length, then slit, different slit ties with different heights, and we for for very high shear rates, we have so-called micro micro slit tie with slit height between 0 0.1 and 0 0.15 millimeters. Uh, rotation rheometer. For example, plate plate system or conant plate are recommended for the measurement of the viscosity at very low shear rates, lower than uh, 500 rates per second. Uh, and the plate plate is actually recommended for the measurement of the flow behavior of fillet polymers because at the at conant plate device the distance between the cone and bottom plate is fixed. The advantage of the cone and plate system is that the uh, a shear rate is independent of the diameter. That means we, we have the same shear rate at every section of the plate and in the plate plate uh, system is the shear rate dependent of the diameter. The, the highest shear rate is at out the side of the plate. And the advantage of plate plate system is you can set the measurement gaps between um, 0 0.5 and 2 millimeters. And you can measure the highly fillet or the fiber fillet materials. Viscosity is affected by many factors. For example, the plasticizer and temperature uh, decrease uh, the viscosity. That means uh, with increasing of the temperature, viscosity will be uh, lower. With increasing of the pressure, the viscosity increase, the molecular weight increase the uh, viscosity too. And if we uh, put the fillers like the fibers or um, metal or ceramic particles with increasing of the after loading, the viscosity increase too. Uh, this dependence is of course not linear. It will be very easy if we can say, okay, the dependence of the pressure is linear. And if you increase the pressure, for example, from 100 bar, this we can compensate this increasing with increasing of the temperature. Of course, in, this is not possible. Uh, for the mathematical approximation of the measured viscosity data, exist uh, a lot of uh, models. One of the most popular uh, model is so-called cross VLF model. With this model it is possible to describe the viscosity dependence of shear rate, temperature, and pressure. Uh, this term described actually the temperature dependence and the pressure dependence is described with A2 and, and D. So for the measurement of the viscosity, we have at the Institute uh, several different devices. Uh, what is actually the PVT? Uh, PVT diagram describes uh, the pressure, volume, temperature changing of the specific volume. And in this slide, you can see on the left side the typical PVT diagram of semi crystalline thermoplastics and on the right side of amorphous polymer. For the measurement of the uh, specific volume, volume independence of the temperature and pressure, 
uh, as exist principally two different uh, measurement techniques. One is the so-called piston dye technique. That means the polymer will be compressed with a movable upper piston. And with the upper piston, we can build up different pressures. With increasing of the pressure, uh, the machine can measure the changing in the height of the uh, sample and using the known mass of the polymer and the known uh, volume, it's very easy to calculate the specific volume at different temperatures and pressures. The other uh, method is so-called uh, fluid technique. The sample is insert in uh, one heated fluid and the pressure building uh, at the polymer will be done using the fluid, for example, mercury. In comparison to the piston dye technique, this fluid technique has one advantage. We have not additionally friction between the sample and the cylinder wall during the measurement. This is a PVT apparatus according to the piston uh, technique in our lab. The next one very important uh, properties for the simulation is thermoconductivity. If you make every um, thermal simulation or you will calculate the cooling time during the uh, additive manufacturing process or extrusion, you need the thermal data like the thermoconductivity. And at market exist a lot of uh, different uh, measurement methods. All these uh, display methods we have in Leoben. Um, differences are yeah, in the measurement techniques, in the measurement range, for example, with uh, modified uh, transient plane source method by the company uh, CTERM. You can measure uh, the thermoconductivity in temperature range between room temperature and uh, 200 degrees. You can use uh, injection molded or the 3D printed um, samples, plates or rectangular shouldered uh, specimens for uh, tensile tests. In the melt region or melt state, we use, for example, K-System 2. This is a method which based on the hot wire method. Uh, and then the other methods like TPS, laser flash, and guarded hot plate. Um, one advantage of the uh, hot wire method is that this method can be installed or can be used, for example, at high pressure capillariometer. And with this device, you can measure the uh, the thermoconductivity independent of temperature and pressure. We have the line source, that means the measurement sensor, which is inserted in the barrel of the high pressure capillariometer. And the bottom side of the barrel is closed. And using the hydraulic piston, we can build up the different pressure in the barrel and on the material and measure the viscosity at higher pressures up to 1000 bar. This is, for example, very important for the injection molding. We know that uh, thermoconductivity increase uh, not only with the temperature and uh, with fillers, the, the 
the thermal conductivity increase with increasing curve depression. Uh, the last one, uh, thermal properties, which is important for the simulation is specific heat. I will not go into the details how it works uh, the device. I think everybody has uh, used this uh, DSC device and have measured. In the next slides, I will show you uh, some uh, uh, expand, experimental results, the results of uh, our measurement at our institute. For example, this is a typical viscosity di diagram for one polypropylene. Uh, this viscosity curve was measured at three temperatures uh, using the two rheometers at uh, in the shear rate range. Uh, up to 100, the measurement were done using the uh, cone and plate rheometer. And at higher points, we have used the um, high pressure capillary rheometer. It's, you can clearly see that with increasing the temperature, the viscosity uh, decrease. And in this case, of the polypropylene, we can see that we can measure the viscosity in wide range of the shear rates. The pressure influence on viscosity, again on polypropylene, and for example, at 200 degrees, this measurement we are done um, at high pressure capillaryometer. Uh, using the counter pressure device, we have uh, realized the counter pressures up to 400, 400 bars. And you can see that if you increase the pressure, for example, for 400 bars, the viscosity increase approximately 25% in this case of the polypropylene. Using the PVT uh, measurement, you can determine very easy the influence of the fillers. In this case, um, influence of the short glass fibers on the density or specific volume of polyamide. You can clearly see that the increasing of the content of the short glass fibers, the specific volume degrees. That's mean uh, that case, the density increase. And what's very interesting is that if you put um, the short glass fibers into the polyamide 6.6, the transition temperature is independent of the filler content. In the other case, uh, if you use the pumped injection molding feedstocks, it means the, the polyolefine uh, fillet with uh, metal particles with powder loading, for example, of 86 weight percent. You can estimate exactly different transition temperature and you can analyze the binder system and you can see that in this case we have two different polymers, one polymer or one part uh, melt with melting temperature of 130 degrees and second one in the range of 50 degrees. In this slide is you can see the influence of the pressure on the thermal conductivity this measurement were done between 100 and approximately 230 degrees on uh, polypropylene, polypropylene. And the pressure was changed from atmospheric pressure up to uh, 80 megapascal. And the increasing 
of the thermal conductivity is very clear. In the solid state, we have uh, the due to due to the crystallization uh, increasing of thermal conductivity for approximately for twenty five percent. In this slide is the same is are the results from of the measurement on the same material. And we can see additionally the influence, not only of the pressure, we can see influence of the fillers. The 48% of talc increase, for example, uh, for approximately 30% the thermoconductivity. And this is all of my side. At the end of the presentation, I will show uh, short information of our, of, 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 of our possibilities for the measurement of the material data in our lab. If you have some interests or some questions, you can contact me. The contact data are displayed. And if you have some questions about this presentation, ask now or later. <laughs> thank you very much thank for you. your... Thank you, Ivica. Uh, I don't see any questions for you. But... Okay. Ivica, um, can you go to the slide 35? 45. Wonderful example. Forty-five. Okay. Forty-five or uh, thirty-five. Uh, thirty-five. Okay. Sorry. One moment. 35. I was just uh, thrown out of the system for one moment. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, please the next one. Okay. Uh, do you think the, uh, no, no, th th this one was the correct one. Okay. Do you think that uh, uh, this has a uh, influence on additive manufacturing with PVT curves? I will not say influence, but of course, uh, during the melting process and during the, for example, for FFF, during the extrusion of the material through the dye. Mm. We have lost Ivica. Ivica, you are frozen. <laughs> okay. Ivica is frozen. Oh, yep. uh, no, he's, frozen. he's back. I'm back. Okay. Okay, you can see the slide, or no? You you must share your screen. I must share again. Again. Um, yeah. I see the screen from Ivica. I cannot see it. I see Ivica. You see me, but you cannot see the screen. Okay, and now? Yeah, it's okay. Now it's a presentation. Okay. Okay. Now, just a moment. This was the timer for the presentation. <laughs> now, of course, if you use the FFF or 3D printing, on the beginning, you must melt your material. And if you use, for example, semi-crystalline material, at a melting temperature, your specific volume is higher. During the cooling, the specific volume decreases. And using the PVT diagram, you can calculate actually the shrinkage. You can predict that shrink shrinkage depends on the temperature difference or temperature or processing conditions. And this is very important to know in the additive manufacturing how big, which amount of the shrinkage you have between the 
printed Be uh, be uh, between laying down the material and okay. solidifying at the room temperature la layers because the first layer is for example solid in solid state and the next layer is in the melted state no? and in the mm -hmm. contact between the between the layers you have the different temperatures and the different shrinkage no? Um, using here we are going from 1.35 to 1.10 if I just take the zero bar because all the other uh, pressure lines are not very important for FFF okay. as we have more or less pressureless printing but here we have a very high shrinkage and we can see you can see it better in the slide uh, 58 because there you had the polar mite. Yes. And there you see, we, here we have a shrinkage about 13%. And this is an, an amorphous polymer. And there we have the, and therefore many amorphous polymers are better used, suitable for printing. Uh, and can you state a little bit about the heat thermal conductivity of polymers overall you just stated one example are there other polymers also in, the, in these regions you mean the thermal conductivity the absolute values of the thermal conductivity or the changing no the absolute values yeah more than less more than less more than less they are very uh, bad heat con heat conductivity. The polymers have the very bad conductivity, especially the unfilled ones. I think is this no. No, I have not example for this, but the thermal conductivity is not so different at polymers in comparison to the metals. Of course, the polymers have the thermal conductivity in the range, I would say 0 0.1 and 0 0.4 watt per meter in cable depends on the fillers or filler content and type of the filler. Yeah, okay, uh, uh, let's polymers, talk about how pure, say, pure polymers. Pure polymers, how, and you say the polymers have very bad thermal conductivity. Uh, very well. low, not bad. Or very low, or, okay, in comparison to metals, bad, very low, it's correct. Right. A very low thermal conductivity. And these are already two examples where I can point out for my, my presentation afterwards. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Our next speaker or presenter is uh, Dr. Stefan Schuschnik. And in his presentation, uh, he'll show you how can you modeling with materials for uh, FFF technology for extrusion uh, with uh, application of ANSYS polyflow, polyflow uh, software. So uh, Dr. Shushnik, please continue. Thank you. Yeah, in the moment I have a little bit of problem. Okay. So, okay. Can you see the screen? Can you see my screen? No, so far, no. no. It says, no. at least I, eh, now it's here. Now it's here, okay. Yeah. Yeah, then welcome to my talk about, uh, in, in, about the workshop in Index Adam modeling of extrusions and polyflow materials and additive manufacturing. 
Uh, I will introduce myself. I'm since 2005 at the Institute. And since 10, 10 years, I'm working with projects uh, with additive manufacturing. And it takes more time and time than the other topic I'm also doing, uh, the extrusion group. Many projects are related at the moment with additive manufacturing as this technique evolved over the last 10 years, a uh, huge amount. For simulation, uh, we have to know a little bit about uh, what to do. And therefore, I want to tell you for a first short into introduction into extrusion products and tools. After that, I will come to uh, ANSYS polyflow simulations. And then I will point out three other possibilities for other simulations or modelings in additive manufacturing. The first thing I want to present are pipes. For example, here we have a spiral mandrel die where we have um, laser pointer, where we have these uh, uh, deep channels which are going around the core and they are getting uh, shallower and shallower. And then here can, you can see you are pressing the material out of these channels from the circular uh, position to the axial, to, to an axial. And therefore, and up at the top, you can, can get the person out and after cooling it down, calibrating, uh, calibrating and cooling, then you can, can get the pipe out of it. The next product I would uh, uh, say is, for example, a profile. With the profile, we are, can produce window profiles or in, or in other cases, different, more or less complex profiles. In this case, the mold comes in here and then I have plates with a different opening inside. And then I'm going out from this rectangular shape to the complex profile more or less here. What's the important for simulation? This is uh, reality. They produced this profile. I think this is a profile for the cables at the walls where you can put the cables inside. And as you can see, this shape is not properly done uh, for a good, uh, for, it's not, not a good product which anybody would by. Um, after they had the, this problem, they got, went to a simulation software and they simulated the profile die. And then they saw here, this is the velocities at the, at the outlet of the die. Overall, they have a quite good shape of the velocities, despite here these uh, spikes of the velocity. So the polymer is flowing out much more quicker than the rest of the than, than, than the rest of the profile, and therefore it has to go somewhere. And in this case, it went wobbling around, and they could see it in reality, but also in the simulation. After proper simulation and the proper setup of the die, they went, they got this profile out. You still have a little bit of a uh, shooting out of the velocities at these tips, but it's okay. And the profile came out straight with straight edges. And so therefore this was not really a problem. Uh, for flat film dies, we can, uh, can use, for example, a coat hanger die where we have different, no, the goal is to get a very even distribution out of the coat hanger die here at the exit so that over the whole width of the of this coat hanger die we have the same velocities and the same thickness because what you don't want is to have thickness variations in there there are different possibilities to calculate them analytically uh, and there is an analytical method for a certain type of coat hanger dies, but the problem is that they have corners inside, 
where the residence time will be too high and then the polymer which is in the hot dye starts to degrade. So therefore we need for each polymer for each processing parameters a certain optimized dye and then it's depending what are you processing if you are processing a single material all day long and you never change it then you will have op an optimized dye for this product for this mass throughput and for these these conditions and then you can get get it out an optimized film if you're changing daily your materials then you have to have a overall good coating or dye which uh, can process most of the material but non optimized um, for blow film dye i have a, a, a similar uh, dye as the spiral manual dye but the spirals are here in the flat uh, in, 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 in a flat direction and we are changing the direction to the axial direction. The nice thing are, at these dyes are we can stack them together and then we can get, for, for example, one blue polymer, uh, the, the blue line is, for example, a polymer with good uh, food contact properties, the red one also, but in between we need, for example, a polyamide uh, layer for uh, CO2 and oxygen barrier. And there are now uh, dyes with up to 11 different layers, each acting as a barrier against certain properties. As all these polymers, as it's uh, been foretold, have different viscosities, then they have to be optimized, the, the flows in between there, the layers where they get together, because very um, polymers with the low viscosity tries to circum uh, tries to surround the polymers with the higher viscosity, and so therefore you have really careful to select the materials and select also all the whole dye design. Um, there are not only in blow film multi-materials, but also in other projects uh, regarding the extrusion, we have diff different materials. It can be in profile extrusion, it can be in pipe extrusion, where we have different layers, but in films, they are mostly used. Another tool for uh, multi-material is in the moment uh, the recycled materials, especially in the profile, in the window profile production, they are using uh, recycled window profiles and they, then the, this recycled material is mostly in the core of the window profile used and the outside is the new one. The smaller the layer at the outsides are, the cheaper the material, uh, the profile gets because the recycled PVC profile is cheaper. How do I do go on with the simulation? I try first to, def uh, the, to define the, goal, the goals, which results are interesting. For, the, for example, for the profile extrusion, the velocities were the most important things and not perhaps the pressures. You will get out the pressures also, but you can also use, for example, do I need the temperatures? And does the temperature have an influence? What are the borders of the model? What simplifications can I, can I get? Do I have to simulate the whole part or can I just use a small part of it because there the changes will be the most critical. For example, I have uh, many simulations done for underwater palletizing and the whole inlet was mostly not interesting because 99% of the pressure loss were at the dye tips. And so therefore, very often I just simulated the dye tips because the pressure loss was the most important thing. On the other hand, with one simulation, we had to 
simulate the whole construct because then the flow lines were the more important so that we can see the residence time distribution inside. Can we use a symmetry? Do we have other physical models where we can state that's a little bit easier? For example, stationary, in extrusion mostly it is stationary, in injection molding where Tom is uh, talking afterwards, he has often a time dependency to inside are there any temperature to look at, at it? Are there any reactions, for example, crystallizations, chemical reactions? And I can, I can make simulations really, really hard to take everything into, in, into account, but mostly it's not visible because you don't have this much uh, calculation power or the material data what you have. Materials, we have a very wide variety of polymers with extremely different behaviors and different flow properties. One colleague of mine uh, processed this pyramid of polymers where we have on one side the amorphous polymers where we can think about the PVT data we got before. And on the other, other hand, we have a semi-crystalline polymers and in orange, we have the commercial available polymers. So ASA, polycarbonate, ABS are mostly used. On the other hand, PLA is a semi-crystalline polymer, but also very widely used, especially in the non-productive 3D printing, I would say. But there are also other polymers um, used for um, additive manufacturing polymide 12, and then here at the tip, we have the high performance polymers, high temperature polymers, polyether meat, po uh, polyether ether ketone, and so on. Some of them are at this time in a scientific literature used, but all, already are going to broaden the market for additive manufacturing materials. Some of them, for example, HDPE, LDPE, uh, we, we tried them to print them, but the problem was due to the PVT diagram and the semi-crystalline, sh uh, the shrinking between the processing temperature and the cooled down, this shrinkage led to not good uh, prints. Let's see the example for uh, ABS and for, for polyamide, both are used in additive, in additive manufacturing. And I just selected some of, uh, some of them out of the database. At the shear rate of 80 uh, reciprocal seconds, the polyamide would need with the FFF die 5.2 bar and the ABS 103 bar. And so therefore it's a huge difference in the processing of different polymers. These are just two examples of polymers, but for additive manufacturing, for sure you would not select this ABS. You would go for another ABS type, which is perhaps with a lower molecular uh, weight and therefore lighter flowing. That's the only equations I would show you. These are the underlying equations in uh, which have to be solved together or one after another, the con uh, equation uh, of states, continuity, motion, and the energy. And in this case, I wrote down the energy for pure Newtonian fluids. Um, all simulations which are for flowing are going with these equations. Yeah, I have here uh, three different geometries. The one geometry is a quarter part of our uh, additive manufacturing die, where we have here our filament diameter with 1.75 millimeter. Here we have our die itself with 0.4 millimeter, I would, would say, and 0.4 millimeter, the height at the build platform or at the layer below, and then I can simulate the pressure losses 
here in this case. In another simulation, I did a very similar setup where I wanted to calculate the temperatures uh, and later on I have to combine these different simulations because this one is purely melt and the melting and the temperature uh, is a combination of a solid material and the melt itself. Or more complex, for example, the uh, cable profile and more complex it, it gets if I have moving parts inside. This here is the extrusion screw what I have. Here inside I have the rotating screw and on the outside I have the flow of my material and then I can change for example rotational speed and I can see for example uh, the mixing behavior of these screws or how the material will move inside and where does it stuck or how does it behave inside. We have done it for once for single screw, but mostly we are doing it or mostly we have done it for uh, twin screw extruders. What are the boundary conditions and the inputs what we need? And they are depending on the complexity of the, pro, of the simulations. I have the inflow and the outflow. If I have wall adhering or wall slipping materials, yeah, if I can use symmetry, it gets much easier. Then the materials, if it's already told about the Newtonian region, many polymers don't act uh, Newtonian, they are non Newtonian, but they are also structural vis uh, viscose behavior which is a more complex to simulate. Then I have the thermal uh, boundary conditions, isothermal or non-isothermal. And then I have a co-extrusion, for example, with up to 11 layers, where I have to take this into account 11 times. How do we calculate it with ANSYS Polyflow? We have some CAD package, and then we can go to the, with the ge geometry to the design modeler or directly in, into meshing, where we just uh, make a mesh in the geometry, where we say, okay, these small cubes, for example, they will be calculated with the underlying, geom uh, underlying equations. Then I have poly data there, there, I have the whole input of the material data, the physical properties of the model, and all of these data, then I go to Polyflow itself. Polyflow itself is just a number cruncher. It can solve huge uh, matrices with these uh, data inside. And after it, 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 it's, it finished, we can use other CAD CAM packages or Polystat for statistical analysis. Mostly I am just looking at the CFD post where I take a look at the first colorful pictures, and then I also can extract the numbers out there. You can also use other post-processing packages. For example, here I have a film die. I only use one half of the film die because the second half, which would be here, is the same. Uh, the goal, the uniform flow over the width. Out here, with the boundaries, we have an inflow, outflow here, we have wall adhering and here we have the symmetry. We have to define the material and the flow rate and then we can go to the simulation. Um, one problem is, for example, if I have here just one element over the height of the film die and I mesh it, I will get this velocity profile at the wall, wall adhering in the middle uh, maximum velocity at the other wall, wall, it, uh, wall adhering. So therefore, it would be two elements. Here is the middle section of the, of the film die. This is the exact profile. So therefore, I say here with three elements over one half with it's going better. In this case, I say minimum 10 over the height of this die. Then I get out my velocities. In this case, this is my goal, what I wanted to see. And you see here, we have a very neat velocity profile with not exactly, but uh, quite good distribution of, 
of our, of our material. Then I take over the second material. Okay. And here you can really see that here in this area, I have much higher speed of about uh, 18 millimeters per second. And here I have three millimeters per second. So therefore you can really see that the, that the simulations also are depending on heavily on the viscosity of the materials. Another example was the round die with different uh, tasks and boundary conditions. And I want to compare the measured and the simulated results. I have a 2D simulation where I have an axis of rotational symmetry here and I get the, and I have the viscosity data and I get out the results of it. Then I have a 3D setup. In this case here, I also have to refine the mesh to a very small size because here most of it happens. And you can really see here in the cylinder, there's nearly no pressure loss. And most of the pressure loss is starting in the round die, what I have. Um, the 2D pressure loss was 820 bars simulated and the 3D 832 bar and the measured pressure was 893 bar. So therefore it was not the best prediction for the 20 millimeter capillary because there would be the possibility that I have ignored my isothermal, uh, I used isothermal conditions and I neglected extensional viscosity or visco elasticity, elasticity in this case. Um, the pressure loss over uh, different flow rates was either overestimated or underestimated. So therefore we can really see that there are different things here where can, we can improve. For example, non-isothermal or viscoelastic calculations. Um, let's go to BAM, simulating BAM. BAM is big area additive manufacturing. The finite element analysis mesh was done with orientation and then we got out coupled thermal stresses. How does these thermal stresses happen? They happen because the people PVT data showed us that we have a shrinkage of the hot polymer, it solidifies and cools down and then it shrinks. And we put in additive manufacturing one layer of material and then the next one layer of hot material, the other cools down. And so therefore this process is very often uh, leading to thermal stresses. In this car, BAM is uh, printer with 2.5 times 6 times 1.8 meters. So it's a really, really big area. It has here an extruder head with about 36 kilograms per hour output, feed it by pellets. And this here is a car body, what they are printing there. Um, they made the complete mesh of this Stratic car here. You can see the mesh. And then they start to simulate the tool pass because they know the tool pass. And then they said, okay, this is printed in this direction. This is printed in this direction and so on. Here you can see the orientations which are assigned to each of these mesh nodes. And with these orientations, they could go to the simulation where they have a machine code, the STL file, uh, the mesh generator, the chopped mechanics, this, this is a multi-layer, uh, 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 multi-scale simulation where they have the chopped fibers are simulated here. Then they create their uh, fam desk, then they make the solution in Abacus and then have also other simulation tools inside and then they see can calculate out of it the damage, what's happening. These, for example, are the distortion of the printed structure due to the just thermally induced residue stresses. You don't see it, but inside here are the big 
Uh, the simulation uh, lasted for 13 hours. The setup was, uh, I think, a one hour, but it was quite a good computer used for it, but it was not a calculation. Uh, it was not a big um, cl computer cluster. It was just a bigger, c a bigger PC. <laughs> And then I have um, these residue stresses there are, uh, and these residue stresses lead to the damaging of the different layers. And you can see here where they say in these areas, the possibilities for uh, cracks are higher. And if you go to, and they also saw that it directly at the car itself that they had in these areas here in the front fender, for example, they had uh, quite thin sections. And in these sections, the cracks propagated mostly. On the other hand, Digimat, uh, for an example, out of an aircraft hinge, Digimat is used for minimizing the warpage, which happens always. And in this case, they have the Ultem polyether emit used for it. And they have, see, they, they put inside the simulation and also the printing and also the temperature development out of it. Um, the deflection, what, here's the, uh, the total deflection. This is clearly heavily depending on the orientation of the part in the build itself, because here it's just flat, but you can also put it in, in other directions. If I, I make these definitions, I go from the flat part, I go to the results, to the deflection, and then I take these deflection and multiply them, them by minus one. So I have an inverse deflection. And then I go back to the manufacturing, to the simulation. And then I have a deformed original part. Then I print this deformed part and the warpage will work against it. Sometimes you are, mostly you have to do it in an iterative way. We, uh, to get after the final uh, simulations, you get the uh, good context out of it. In this case, the original value is 50 millimeters. That's one measurement here at the hinge. The warped part was 50.5 millimeter. And by compensating it with Digimod, they got back to uh, 50.002. So therefore less than 0.004% error between the original and the compensated part. Uh, I tried it uh, due to the lack of material data. I was not able to fulfill this simulation. This simulation was done with the polyether uh, poly emit and Stratus is behind it and they got really all the material data for this uh, for this part in the in the airplane. Um, let's go to the last simulation I want, want to see. Uh, virtual AM process, it's emulating the extrusion process. It can interpret G code and the virtualize the printer, the movements, and also the, the positioning of it. It was developed for a detection of collision because they have a printer, which is not only Cartesian, which most of the printers with three degrees of uh, freedom, but really have five degrees because here they have the printhead and here they have the table, which can on one side rotate and then it can also tilt about it. And therefore the possibilities of collisions are quite higher than with the normal Cartesian uh, printers. 
Um, the exclusion is not taken into account. It just draws cubes or spheres, depending what you want and how much time you have, because a cube has uh, six sides, a sphere has 27 sides. Uh, in this case, that is, the, is described by 27 sides. And then you can see here over time, the positioning, the velocity, and also the acceleration. What are you, where, where, where you are going to be. And then you can also visualize it. And that's a nice thing to, to see if you have more complex uh, geometries. And I think that there are already some printers in development and also commercially available where the print head is not only used in the three axis. We are to get, or we had a project where we had a six axis robot arm with a, uh, with a die on it and so on. And so therefore I think there will be some developments in these cases. Let's come to the Conclusion, uh, there are many different simulations av available and many uh, different simulation tools. There is not one solution for all and the material data is often missing. We are measuring some of them, but other possibilities we don't have. For example, um, Digimat uses uh, anisotropic material behaviors with uh, properties different in each direction. Most of these projects and softwares are not easy to use and need more, mostly specialized trained stuff. And therefore, I would suggest that if you want to start for these simulations, think about it if you are a company, if you really want to have one, if you really need so high numbers of simulation that it really gets off, that you are that you can really can afford one person who is just doing the simulations. If you, knew, if you don't use so many simulations in extrusion, for example, then you can go for commercial uh, available technical offices which can simulate these problems for you. If you have any problems, please contact me. And then I want to thank for your attention and I said the whole pro, uh, project or uh, uh, this presentation in, in out of Enix Adam. Thanks. Thank you, Stefan, for your presentation. And uh, we have a question. Yeah, the one question I already answered. Already answered. Okay, no one else uh, asked uh, any any further question. It's very interesting, uh, interesting uh, presentation, and it's the same as in traditional technologies. Also, uh, maybe a little bit more will mm, tell us uh, uh, Thomas in, in in his presentation. There is also a problem of spatial trained staff who is able to perform a high quality uh, simulation because uh, uh, you must be uh, critical uh, uh, on results that you have obtained and you must interpret them on the right way because sometimes you can you can uh, make a wrong conclusion uh, against the, the uh, results that you received. Uh, yes, because and, 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 and therefore you really have to know what is is it possible or not that, that yeah. the, these results? Because quite often uh, these simulations tool, for example, uh, one of the problems was in the older versions, uh, the matrices are free of units. So therefore you really had to take care what units you are using over the whole thing. Because if you start with a millimeter CAD file, then you have to transform everything into millimeter uh, unit system and not into meter. But very often the material data is clearly stated as SE unit and in, and in meter. And if you start wrong, you get the wrong, uh, completely wrong results out of it. This will, is just one tiny, tiny problem which can arrive there. But over time, uh, you really get to know about it and then you also take care of it. 
there's also um, there's a question about question, yeah. the SOS, SOS yeah. process. I think yes, they are working <clears throat> on it. <clears throat> As far I think in metallic in metals they are already simulating it. Yeah. In polymer powders, I don't know. I'm just uh, concentrating on the FFF. We can expect in the future that there will be more uh, processes that can be simulated for from, yep. from this uh, area of additive manufacturing. For SLM technology, there is a possibility for simulation, uh, but uh, I'm not sure for polymers also. I, uh, yeah. okay. I don't know, but for metals, I'm sure that they are already yeah. simulating yeah. it and they get quite good results out of it because in SLS, they also have the problem of warpage. They also have to have the problem of the thermal history and the thermal stresses inside. Yeah. As and well in for them, it's really necessary. Yeah. Okay, Stefan, thank you again for your uh, interesting presentation. And uh, if we don't have any further question, I would like to invite you, Thomas Lusishin, also from uh, Montana University in Leoben, to um, present us uh, possibilities of a simulation of uh, metal injection molding. It's not maybe strictly connected to uh, additive manufacturing, but uh, uh, we can also uh, uh, see some, some possibilities of uh, simulation in, in this area. So Thomas, please, can you continue? Yeah, thank you, Damir, for your introduction. Uh, maybe at the beginning, uh, also um, concluding the words of Stefan regarding the trained staff and, and, and interpreting the results correctly, there's a nice saying for simulation, which says that uh, simulation makes a good engineer a better engineer, and simulation makes a bad engineer a dangerous engineer. So you really need to know, you get color pictures, but you really need to know how to interpret them and to use them, otherwise you might get, go totally wrong. So really have to put simulation into the right hands. Okay, um, then let's start with my presentation. It's it's about basically or, or focusing on powder injection molding, the process itself and the simulation and some comparisons. Uh, but also uh, it's about uh, an attempt to kind of misuse the simulation software for injection molding also to, to simulate some aspects of uh, extrusion-based additive manufacturing. So the content of my talk will be first a short introduction to injection molding in general and then to the powder injection molding process. Then I will show you some of our experiments we did with injection molding with powder injection molding feedstocks. Uh, one important topic was here the experimental characterization of the powder volume concentration regarding the, the phase separation issue. And then show you some slides about the simulation of the pin process. And then in the end, I will try to show you a little bit of our attempts to misuse the injection molding simulations of the also for trying to simulate some aspects of the additive manufacturing process. So our introduction first start with the injection molding process itself. So it's, it's one of the most important polymer processing methods with the following advantage. It's, it's a very direct path from the raw material to the final part. So typically there is no or only little further treatment of the parts necessary at the end of the process. And it's also a fully automated process is possible, which allows us to, to produce parts at large numbers in the high reproducibility. So we're talking here about really mass production. So it's totally the, the contrast to additive manufacturing where we are typically talking about a few parts. So if you try to produce parts, a few parts only with injection molding, it would be way too expensive. But as soon as you're going to higher numbers, then it's, it's more feasible and economically feasible. <clears throat> the part size is ranging from very small parts, from tiny gears, from in the range of like one milligram, up to huge containers, up to 150 kilograms. So how is the process running? Just a uh, short moment. So we have <clears throat> the injection unit is typically uh, you have two major parts of the machine. It's first on the one side, you have the so-called injection unit or plasticizing unit, which is basically responsible for transporting, melting and injection of the material. And on the other hand, we have the clamping unit, which holds the mold and, and where the shaping is happening. So the injection unit consists of a, a simple metal barrel, which has some heater bands outside <clears throat> to heat the material. 
Uh, typically, processing temperatures for thermoplastic materials in injection molding are typically in the range of 200 to 300 uh, degrees Celsius. The raw materials goes up, go up to 450, but typical polymers are in this range. In the barrel, we have the, the core part of the injection unit is the screw, which can either move in rotational movement or also in axial movement. Rotational movement for feeding new material and actual movement for injecting the material. That's also why the whole process is called injection molding. Uh, the pellets are going in through the hopper, can either be manually, just put, uh, push it in here, or, um, or you have some, some pneumatic uh, conveyor system where you automatically the pellets are transported into the machine. In the clamping unit, it mainly consists of a fixed machine platen and a moving machine platen and onto these two platens the mold is fixed which consists of two mold halves which are forming the cavity and additionally we, uh, yeah, the moving platen can as the name says can move forward and backward to open and close the mold so once the part is shaped and cooled down the mold is um, moved backward and then the part can be demolded. Additionally we also need some temperature control unit to control the temperature of the mold so it needs to be a compromise between cold enough to be fast in processing, to not to lose time, to be economically effect, you know, efficient, uh, but not too cold so that maybe the metal freezes too early or the, the surface uh, quality is bad. So we always need to find a compromise between sufficiently high for a good quality, but sufficiently low for, for fast and economically feasible process. So that's how a real machine looks like. It's one of our machines in our lab, one uh, fully electric machine. Here on the right hand side, we see the injection unit. It's basically here, this is the barrel, which is protected with protection metal sheets to not to, to touch it and also to insulate against heat losses. Here is the hopper. And in that case, we have an automatic uh, material transport. The pellets are fed into the hopper by the system. And on the left side, we have the clamping unit. Here, the fixed mold platen and the, the moving mold platen. And there are the two mold halves currently in the open state. So then in the cycle, it would just close here and then the melt could be injected into the cavity. Um, I want to briefly show you the, the cycle of injection molding for a standard conventional injection molding process. So typically the starting position is that normally the mold is open, the injection unit, the whole injection unit is in the back position and also the screw is in the back position so that in front of the screw tip, there is a sufficient amount of melted uh, polymer which is then in the next step injected into the cavity. So what is happening in the, happening in the beginning is that the mold is closing. The whole injection unit is uh, coming into contact with the mold. And then the screw starts to move forward to inject the melt, which is in front of the screw into the cavity, into the shape, which we want to obtain. At the first moment when the hot melt is contacting the, the cold mold, it starts to cool. And then in the next step, there is some compression phase and also the so-called packing or holding phase, which is necessary to compensate for shrinkage of the polymer. This is one step, which is nice that we can do that in injection molding, which is not possible as we heard before in um, additive manufacturing. So what is basically done is here, the cavity is already volumetrically completely filled, but as it is cooling down, it starts to shrink. So there is more space again uh, available for the material. So we push additional material into the cavity as long as it is possible. So as long as the gate is not frozen, we can still add more material into the cavity. We pack it more intensively, we increase the density. And by that, we can decrease the amount of shrinkage that is happening. Uh, then we come to the point when the gate is frozen. So no more material can enter the cavity. And from that moment on, we can now start to feed new material. So the screw is rotating and moving backward. Uh, conveying more melt into this space in front of the screw tip uh, and that the amount of volume is equivalent to the amount of volume we want to inject and, and pack into the material. Then we still need some, some more time to cool down the part inside the mold so that it's stiff and rigid enough so that it can be safely demolded. And then the mold opens, the part is demolded, and then the cycle starts again from the beginning. So this is a, a, a process which is running in cycles. It's not a continuous process like extrusion, but it's a discontinuous process. The cycle times are ranging from very short times for very thin walled parts for packaging, for example, in the range of a few seconds, up to more than a minute or a few minutes for really large parts, depending on the, on the thickness of the part. 
Here I have a, an animation of the process again. Uh, so this is the machine, the mode is closing, injection unit is moving forward, injection phase, um, feeding, injection unit moves back, opening of the mold and demolding. Once again, we are looking now into the barrel. So mold is closing, unit is approaching, then the screw is moving forward to inject the material, then the feeding of the material, going back, opening of the mold and demolding. So that's a typical um, uh, cycle of injection molding. Uh, now I come to this more special process of this so-called powder injection molding or PIM um, process. What is it? Um, it is a, an edge shape process for the production of metal or ceramic parts. So we are not producing polymer parts, but the target is to produce metal or ceramic parts. Basically, the polymer is degraded to the role of a, of a transport medium. It is just for the transport and shaping, but it's in the end product, it's not uh, there anymore. You can distinguish between MIM and SIM, so it's metal injection molding or ceramic injection molding. And typical applications are complex small parts, once again, of ceramic or, or metal in large quantities. So if conventional shaping processes of metal shaping are not feasible or economically not so feasible, and or the, comp uh, the geometries are too complex, then injection molding is a very nice tool or nice method to, to produce those parts. The material which is used on the injection molding machine is now a mixture of, of powder and a so-called polymer binder. And the shaping process is happening via the injection molding process. This is a very important step. So injection molding in this processing step of the whole value chain of this PIM process is, has a very big influence on the final part quality. We see some very special flow phenomena of these materials, of this mixture of powder and binder. It doesn't behave like ordinary polymer materials. Uh, there's also a very fast cooling due to the high thermal conductivity. So uh, as we have a lot of powder inside with the high thermal conductivity, typically of metal or ceramic, the total thermal conductivity of the compound is quite high which means that it cools down very rapidly and also freezes early. So we have to be careful about premature freezing of the material. And there is one issue that is specific for this powder injection molding is this potential phase separation as we have a kind of suspension of, of particles in a, in a liquid that there could be some phase separation, which is, which is not desired because those phase separation uh, regions are prone to some errors of the final product. So how does this PIM process look like, the whole process chain? So we are starting with a powder, ceramic or metal powder, and we want to have a final product, which is a, a sintered metal or ceramic part. The PIM process is not that direct as we see here, but we have to go a long way. So first we have to add some binder, which is typically a polymer, a thermoplastic polymer. They are mixed, they are melted to a homogeneous compound, and then in the end, they are pelletized to produce feedstock pellets which are then uh, just used on a kind of conventional injection molding machine. The only thing about this machine is that it has to be additionally wear resistant because we are machining or processing some abrasive powders inside. And then out of the machine, we get a part which is called the so-called green part, which still consists of both the powder and the binder. And the next step, we have to get rid of the polymer because in the end, we would like to have just a metal or ceramic part and not a polymer part. So for this getting rid of the, of the polymer, we have the so-called debinding process, which can either be solvent based or thermal induced or com a combination of both. Um, and then what comes out here is the so-called brown part, which is quite brittle. You have to handle it carefully. It still consist, uh, consists of a little bit of uh, polymer. You can imagine it like a kind of glue um, keeping the, the powder together. Otherwise, if you remove all of the binder here, then we end up in the two heaps of powder here again. So there's a little bit of residual uh, polymers uh, in the material, which then disappears in the final stage of sintering in the sintering furnace. Uh, the rest of the binder evaporates here and then the, the under pressure and temperature, then we get the final product, the sintered product. So that's the whole process. And this injection molding part is very crucial for the process or for the part quality in the end. So that's, the, the idea that we would also like to be able to simulate this process and all the related potential uh, errors or potential um, yeah, problems. Um, we wanted to test the, the PIM simulation capabilities of in Autodesk Mode Flow Insight, which is a 
commercial injection molding simulation software and it has this uh, PIM simulation tool inside. We did some injection molding experiments to validate the simulation results. Uh, for that purpose, we used a metal powder feedstock and uh, produced tensile testing specimens. Then we had to set up the simulation model. For that purpose, we also had to implement a special rheological model with the so-called solver API. So that means mold flow allows the user to add uh, their own material models to the simulation software. It requires some programming. But there was also quite some good uh, help in, in Morpho to, to help you how to set up such an additional um, user-defined function. Then we did the simulations, uh, taking the process settings from the experiments. Then one issue was how to characterize the powder volume fraction as we wanted to compare this phase separation results from the simulation with the real parts. So first we even had to find a suitable characterization method of how the powder is distributed in the compound. And at the end, of course, we did some comparison of the simulation with the experiments. We focused there on the flow pattern, so how well the flow pattern can be predicted by the simulation software. We had a look at the pressure prediction and we had a look at the powder volume concentration. So let's start with the injection molding experiments. So we used an artwork around the pin machine, which we had in our lab. We produced those tensile testing specimens according to this uh, ISO standard 3167 type A specimen. Um, there was one issue we, we had a, quite a, the, this all around the pin machine is quite small. So the two cavity mold which we have is too large in volume for our machine. So we blocked one cavity with a polymer part so that the machine, this cavity cannot be filled. Uh, and then we can produce just one part in this mold, which, also, which is also fine. Uh, on the one hand, we performed a filling study. So we performed short shots at two injection speeds uh, to see how the melt is flowing into the cavity. So to have a look at the filling pattern, specifically the shape of the flow front. And also we performed full injection molding cycles, including packing phase and everything at two injection speeds with a focus on the pressure curves in the cavity and the machine nozzle. So if we are able to predict the pressure requirements of the machine, we had a look at the phase separation, powder and binder, and also the part shrinkage. So this is the setups. This is our smaller PIM machine. And in the PIM machine, we had this mold with two cavities, two specimens, tensile testing specimens. So we simply produced first uh, polymer specimens with this, then we cut it and we put it into the one cavity so that it is blocked. And so it, at each injection step, we only injected one cavity. Uh, we had pressure transducers in the mold so that we were able to measure the pressure during the injection phase. Uh, now it comes to this experimental characterization of the powder volume concentration, which is not that simple. So there are different options for the characterization. On the one hand, we had a look at potential optical methods. So either using a microscope, we also did some trials with computer tomography. But in the end, we were not successful because yeah, it's just the resolution was not fine. There are some publications using computer tomography with, with um, yeah, um, synchrotron radiation, which means you need a, a accelerator, a huge plant to go there to do your experiments. So it's not for everyday use in, in our labs. So the other option is gravimetric method, and that's also what we chose. Then we chose the so-called thermogravimetric analysis or DGA, which is a you know, typical procedure for measuring uh, the composition or the yeah, composition of, of compounds. <clears throat> Basically, it's a controlled heating of a sample in a furnace. So we have a, a furnace with a, a sample holder and a, a very sensitive balance. And then you heat your sample from room temperature up to 600 degrees C. And during the heating, you're continuously measuring the sample mass. And in this case, as you have a combination of inorganic and organic components, the organic components, in our case, the polymer binder is evaporating and therefore the mass of this remaining material is decreasing. This can be measured. So the inorganic component remains, in that case, the, the metal powder and the weight loss is then equivalent to the weight percentage of the polymeric component. So by that you can measure the composition, how much uh, weight percent of your polymer bound, uh, binder is in there and how much weight percent of the, of the metal powder is in there. 
Um, as the simulation results are only in volume percent, we had to transform the weight percentage into a volume percentage, which is based on known values of the powder density and also compound density, which we obtained from PVT, as well as the documented masses. From that, you can derive the, the or transform from weight, per, uh, volume, weight percent into volume percent. The nice thing about this method is that rather small samples are sufficient. So you need around 10 milligrams of a sample to, to measure this which is equivalent with the density of the feedstock of about five uh, gram per cubic centimeter, you end up in a cube of roughly two cubic millimeters, which is a cube with a side length of roughly 1.2 millimeters. So it's, it's small enough to really get local values within the part. Then some, some aspects of modeling of the pin process. So um, we have this metal powder with a polymeric binder system. In our case, the binder system was not known. So we did not, it was a commercial grade, but we didn't get any information on the, on the used binder system. We knew that there was a metal powder in Inconel 718. Uh, it's a nickel chromium alloy that was used. And we defined, or we, we determined the initial powder volume concentration with about 62%, which was obtained by the TGA measurement of the pellet. Um, one critical value, which is important for the simulation is the powder radius. And there's a, a strong limitation of this model, which is currently existing in mode flow. Currently, you can only use a single value for the powder radius in this so-called suspension balance model, which is the basis of mode flow. But in reality, you always have for powder feedstocks, you have a, a size distribution. So you have small particles in it, you have large particles in it. <clears throat> and now of course the question arises, which particle size is representative? So this is a, a microscopic image of, of one of the, of, of the material with the binder. So you don't see all the powder particles <clears throat> very well because the binder is still there. But still you can estimate you have very small particles, you have big particles, you have intermediate size particles. So what is really the representative size? And in that case, we, we just decided to use an average or medium size, which would be this size. So we took about five micrometers radius, which is <clears throat> equivalent to 10 micrometers diameter. Uh, to make things more complex, also the rheological behavior is a little bit different from normal behavior. So we have not typically this Newtonian plateau, which you find in normal thermoplastic materials, but you have a kind of yield stress. So you know those curves already from our first presentation in the morning from, from Ibiza. So typical polymer behave like, behave like that. So we have this Newtonian plateau at lower shear rates, uh, which can be well described with this cross WLF equation. And the real behavior of a feedstock is that for low shear rates, it, the viscosity is increasing rapidly. So it rather behaves like a solid body instead of a, a melt. And this increase of the viscosity can, this can be described with this herschel balkley extension. So you take your cross WLF equation, don't have to discuss it. So viscosity as a function of the shear rate. And again, the viscosity as a function of temperature and pressure. And then you extend this equation by an additional term, which uh, consists of this um, yield stress term uh, divided by the shear rate. And the yield stress itself can also be described as a, a function of temperature. So using this equation, you can describe this behavior in a um, sufficient way. And this behavior had to be implemented in mode flow as a, as a user of subroutine. Now I'd like to show you some results of the experiments and simulation. <clears throat> the first one is uh, showing the filling pattern. So what we see here is a filling study. Here is just the first part is the, the runner is filled, then part of the specimen is filled, and it goes from left to right to the final filling of the part. And on the left side, we see the experimental uh, results. And on the right hand, we see the corresponding simulation results. While it fits quite well here at the beginning, so there is not much deviation between the, the simulation and the experiments, we see a significant difference here in the flow behavior when the melt comes from the narrow part into the wider part here. The real behavior is that the, the material has a tendency to like shoot forward and then afterwards it's filled to the sides. But in the simulation, this cannot be considered obviously. It's the, the simulation is not capable of doing this. So it's filled like a conventional thermoplastic melt. If you, would, if you had a thermoplastic melt like a polypropylene, you would not see this phenomenon. This is really very specific for these powder injection feedstocks, but you would also see something like that. So for normal materials, it would be fine, but for the specific material, there are still problems 
uh, this jetting phenomenon is not yet really yeah considered correctly so we tried everything that the software uh, gives us as possibilities so we, we used inertia uh, we used gravity options uh, also this herschel bike behavior but still it was not what we expected an additional attempt was to improve the simulation results by using the wall slip effect, which is also uh, included in mode flow. There are some velocity parameters in mode flow which we can change. So it's this critical shear stress which we can change. It's the slip exponent here that can be changed and also the slip coefficient which can be changed. So basically we played around with these values. We didn't have any experimental or measured values. So we just did some parameter studies um, uh, that really um, do you still see my screen? Um, it's been cut off, I think. Sorry, no, we can't. Oh, okay, I have to share again. Sorry, I lost yes. my seams. Oh, just a moment, I'll share again. So I'm here again. So you should be able to see my screen again. I just want to open also the... It's just showing, thank you. Okay. Just a moment. Okay, I uh, just don't see the question and answers. I have to activate this just a moment. Okay, now I see also the questions again. So, sorry for that. Let's continue. So we played around with these parameters just as a parameter study, not without real values, but, but in the end we found out it's there was a slight improvement. So the the shape of the melt front improved or was showing a similar behavior like this one, but not, not really the reality. But at the same time, the pressure results were so unrealistic that we, we stopped this. So there's really some, some issues that is not yet solved. So we are working on this to improve. There was one question in the, in the question. Uh, if there is some machine learning approach to improve the simulation results, um, not yet. And, and also this could be an option. But on the other hand, our approach would be rather to really try to understand what is the real flow behavior behind and really find physical models, which I think it's, um, I, I would prefer this, but if we don't find a physical solution for that, of course, some machine learning results or the machine learning approaches could be an approach to, to improve the simulation results. Uh, another result was the pressure results in the screw chamber, so directly in front of the screw tip, so in the machine. Um, and here we see the pressure over the time, over the injection time. So we see the sharp increase of the pressure during the filling phase. And then the pressure is decreased for the packing phase where we apply a constant pressure, which is set from the machine. And here the green line represents the measured values of the pressure transducer. And the red line represents the simulated results. And of course, also here you can see there's a big difference of the filling pressure. And unfortunately it's under prediction. So if you rely on simulation and think it's fine with 700 bar, then you would end up in like 1700 bar. So that's of course a, a problem. Um, there is still something that is may perhaps happening inside the conversion flow of the nozzle. We also had a look at the pressure dependence, which is not originally measured. So pressure dependence is always like an add-on of your rheological characterization. So we also, we didn't measure it, but we tried with this coefficient um, of the, you can use one coefficient of the PVD model, which can then be used in the rheological model as a like a starting point if you don't have the real measured values to have a to see the influence. And it showed a slight improvement. So the pressures, the simulated pressures were higher, but still still far away from the reality. So there is still, I think there is happening something inside the converging flow of the nozzle, uh, where potentially there is some, some blocking where the powder is breaching and then blocking the, the melt flow. Because basically we do not have a melt, we have powder and, uh, and with a 
concentration of 60% volume percent powder and just some polymer around the powder. So it's not really a, a suspension anymore. It's really powder, which is enabled to flow by the surrounding um, polymer binder. So there's still more research work for rheologists and we are still working on this. Another result is the powder volume concentration, uh, one millimeter below the surface. So we look onto the part, uh, the machine uh, is just a moment. So the melt is coming into here. There's the gate location, it comes in here, then it flows here a little bit. And then most of the flow goes in this direction, filling the cold specimen. And what we see here, here are the results, the volume percentage uh, from the prediction of the simulation. In this area, we have some higher concentration of like 63 or 64% almost. Here, it's a lower concentration. Again, here in this um, stagnation zone, we see some higher concentration. We compared this with TGA measurements. So we took samples from these regions, from this region, from this region, and from this region, <clears throat> and did some TGA measurements. And we found out that although the absolute values were not uh, really matching perfectly, the tendency was at least visible. So in this region, we had a higher value, in this region, a lower value, and in this region, a higher value again. So this relative distance uh, difference between the three investigated positions was quite well predicted but there was an underestimation of the absolute powder volume concentration. And this is closely related also to this big issue of the, um, of the radius influence on the model. So we did also some additional simulation with using a powder radius of one micrometer and one with 10 micrometers, and you see totally different results. So the initial simulations were performed with five micrometers and we had this result. And if we are doing the same with one or 10 micrometers, we see that the smaller the particles get, the more homogeneous the concentration is. So we have a very even distribution of the powder. The bigger the particles become, the more inhomogeneous the, the compound gets. So that's really the bad thing is that the, the simulation is very sensitive to this particle radius. And in general, bigger particles have shown more variation of the powder volume in the part. Which brings us back to this question of this initial question, which size is representative if we have a distribution in reality and can only enter one value. Okay, so this is all about injection molding, but then we tried to see if we can kind of misuse the simulation also for um, simulating parts of a, of a dye or a nozzle of a fused um, uh, deposition, uh, so FDM process. So we had a look at two different materials, so two feedstocks, also once again, powder injection molding feedstocks with different viscosity behavior. So viscosity over shear rate for two different material, feedstock one, feedstock two. We had a look at three different nozzle diameters. So basically this is the, the nozzle of the, of the 3D printer. And or, or here is the, sorry, here is the filament coming in and here's the nozzle of the 3D printer. And we changed here the nozzle diameter as a parameter <clears throat> to see the effect on especially um, the powder concentration, which was the main result which we were interested in. And we also changed the layer thicknesses. So here the filament comes down and here's the, the dye and here the filament would come out and we had a look at the distance here. So one uh, situation we had a very wide distance between the platform and the extruder dye. <clears throat> and then the other extreme had a very small gap between the platform and the extruder dye. So we varied these uh, parameters, which is kind of mimicking the layer thickness of the deposited filament. And we did some parameter studies. And in the end, uh, we wanted to see how, how the material behaves when it comes out here and also regarding the powder concentration in this area. So uh, the printing speed was set to 30 millimeters per second with a filament diameter of 1.75 millimeters. And um, injection molding is a, is a, um, a non-continuous process. So as soon as the cavity is filled, the simulation stops. But we wanted to simulate some kind of continuous flow through the nozzle. So what we had to do is to try and kind of create some dummy volume around this area where the melt could flow in without any flow resistance. So it's a huge volume. There is no small gap. So the material can go easily in here without any flow resistance. So basically the flow along here until here, it's, it's interesting for us. It mimics the real situation. And what is around here is just for some space where the melt can go somewhere so that we have some continuous filling time of 10 seconds where the material is flowing through here. 
and maybe some, some conditions can change here during this continuous flow. Uh, temperatures, which we said was the platform here, was set to 60 degrees, which is similar to 3D printing, and the rest was uh, set to 200 degrees. So this is the flow path where the melt is flowing, and, and the platform was set to 60 degrees C. So here is the injection location, so it comes along, the melt comes along here, this cross-section, and then it goes into this smaller nozzle. Uh, one thing we had a look at is also the, the pressure drop between the entrance and the, the die gap. Uh, to see if we can simulate this, to know how much pressure is needed to squeeze the material through the nozzle. Uh, and as you can see here, most of the pressure drop happens in this nozzle. There is hardly any pressure difference in here. It's all the same pressure. It's basically ambient pressure, and then the pressure develops to this level. Uh, typically, going through a nozzle, you would see a decreasing pressure from the beginning of the nozzle to the end of the nozzle where it comes out. But we have saw here some strange peak here, which was then explained because the material is flowing here, and then it goes against the opposite wall, and there is some kind of, also some kind of stagnation zone, and there is some hydrostatic pressure building up here, which increases the pressure again towards the end. Uh, you can see it here, here's the velocity, so most of the material goes out here, but here it's kind of stagnating and then producing or pushing the material against the wall creating some additional pressure here, which we saw in this, in this peak. So that was at least some, some explanation why we had this peak, which was not, not yeah, usual. And then the final slide, it's just uh, showing you the variation of the different influences of the nozzle diameter and the, the distance between the platform and the nozzle. So looking from left to right, we see the variation of the nozzle diameter. So the small nozzle, intermediate nozzle and big nozzle. And comparing top and bottom pictures is the difference between a wide gap here and a smaller gap here. And what is shown here in the results is the powder segregation. So basically it's the volume concentration of the powder. <clears throat> and you can see some differences between the different setups. So here, for example, you would see on these walls, there would be some higher concentration of powder uh, due to the different flow conditions here. Uh, this is a first, like say, let's say a first step towards simulating this. There are still some uncertainties about the results. So it's just showing you these results, but yet it's not yet perfect. So there are some, some results which still are unclear why they are as they are. And, and also you see here there's these strange patterns here, which are a little bit strange. So we still need to work on this, but it's a starting point at least. And still you can use like, um, uh, simulation or soft injection molding simulation to at least simulate part of the FDM process. It's also useful for that. Okay, then summarizing my talk is I introduced you to the PIM process. So alternatively to additive manufacturing, you can use also injection molding to produce ceramic or metal parts using injection molding as an intermediate, an important intermediate shaping process. Uh, I showed you that we have some very special flow phenomena in this, with these materials in injection molding, which are still hard to simulate or not yet possible to simulate correctly. I also showed you powder concentration simulation, which is already possible. The qualitative results are already useful. You see differences, you see where problem, problematic zones are, but still the absolute values are not um, there where we want to have them. And I also showed you an approach to use the injection molding software also to simulate some aspects of this uh, FFF process. Um, and yeah, one of the results was this pressure drop along the nozzle. So you can choose different materials. You can estimate how much pressure you would need to produce, the, uh, to squeeze the filament through the nozzle. And also showed you first results regarding the powder segregation, which is really important if we could simulate this, because if we know the correct powder concentration. This would give us some hint on where, the, where is a powder, an agglomeration of powder there, or other way, if there is an agglomeration of polymer binder, there will be a void in the final product if we remove the binder. So it's important to know if it's a very homogeneous distribution, which is desired, or if we have some spots where we have a, a higher concentration. So it's, it would be important to know this. It's still not perfect, but yeah, still working on this. Okay, then thank you for your attention. And of course, some uh, the questions are welcome. Thank you, Thomas, for your uh, interesting presentation. And uh, 
we had one question and one comment. Uh, you already answered it on the question. Yeah. And uh, okay, I just have a comment that we can expect in the future more uh, this type of tools for a prediction of uh, par uh, quality parts produced, uh, par uh, quality of the parts produced with additive manufacturing. And uh, a lot of them will use this uh, uh, tools for uh, uh, process simulation so that we can have more uh, reliable. Uh, reliable uh, data, especially because we are expecting in the future development of new materials, uh, which are maybe uh, unknown for yeah. from today's uh, point of view. Uh, Isa will speak about uh, functional grade additive manufacturing, which is uh, a new uh, area in, in, in this uh, additive manufacturing application. So uh, it's uh, really important to know uh, what can you expect from the final part, uh, especially because uh, we are witness, uh, witnessed that uh, more and more applications are really uh, serious, like in aerospace industry, medical uh, application, and so on. So uh, we can expect further development in this area uh, for uh, development of new tools uh, for a prediction of uh, added manufactured parts, uh, regardless the material or uh, uh, technology. So each technology and each material, of course, must have a appropriate, uh, appropriate data for a uh, simulation. And again, you also, as, as uh, already we discussed with Stefan, you also must be here very careful with uh, uh, interpreting the results yeah. in order to, to get uh, uh, right or not, uh, not wrong decision or mm. uh, impression. So if there is no any other question, we are almost on time. And uh, during the our timetable, time uh, we have a short break uh, until 12, until the noon. And then we will proceed with uh, two presentations. Uh, one presentation is uh, from Julia from uh, IDEMA Institute, uh, and she will speak about uh, preparation of uh, metallic powder and how you can uh, influence uh, with the different uh, uh, properties of the powder on the, uh, the final part properties. And uh, in last presentation, uh, Israt from Brunel University will show us uh, an overview of functional grade additive manufacturing. So uh, two very interesting also presentations. Uh, I would like to thank to all three authors, uh, presenters uh, from this first session. It was really interesting and uh, thanks to, to uh, showing us uh, uh, some development and uh, uh, research from, from their side. So uh, we will be back again uh, at 12 o'clock. Thank you very much so far. See you again for a little bit more than half an hour. Okay. Bye. Bye. Oh, hello again to everyone. Hello. It's uh, noon, according to my, uh, my clock. So uh, we can start with the second second uh, session of our presentation, in which uh, we have uh, two presenters. Uh, one is uh, Julia from uh, Institute uh, IDMA from Valencia. And she will speak about the development and characterization of uh, advanced metallic uh, editing manufacturing materials 
and uh, she will show us how we can control the final part uh, produced with the additive manufacturing of uh, metals. Uh, again, if uh, someone uh, new uh, came to, to our workshop, just a reminder, uh, as a participant, you have opportunity to put a question through button question and answers, uh, because in, in a webinar mode, you have no possibility to put the question uh, orally directly in, into the session. And uh, presenters can answer immediately, or uh, if uh, they want, they can answer at the end of the, of the session. In a second presentation, uh, we'll uh, hear something about uh, a functional grade detailing manufacturing uh, and uh, ESAT will show us uh, from Brunel University uh, will show us uh, uh, some some overview of, of this uh, type of uh, technologies and what does it mean functional graded material so uh, Julia please you can continue can you hear me can you hear me Yes. And we can see you. So you just have to share your screen. Yes. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes, yes. we can see you. We can see the screen and presentation. It's a okay. first first slide. Yes, I will start. So, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Julia Ureña, and I work in IDIME, it's a technological institute uh, in, in Spain. Today, I will talk to you about the development and characterization of advanced metallic additive manufacturing materials. I will explain you some strategies from the power control to the final part. Uh, first, I want to introduce you uh, our department, which is the Advanced Manufacturing Process Department. As you can see, um, we have um, all of these uh, additive manufacturing technologies for processing both uh, metals. We have uh, laser powder diffusion as well as electron beam melting. And for processing polymers, we have a stereolithography, a selective laser sintering, also multi jet fusion from HP. With, uh, with all of these technologies, uh, we work in different areas such as um, technical consultancy, design for additive manufacturing, the materials development, uh, together with the qualification, these topics and uh, these two topics uh, we present to you today. And we also perform some development uh, of technology for some specific application, as well as we offer um, training for uh, university, for companies and, and technological institutes. So regarding materials, uh, we start with the material, with the powder characterization. And then we continue with the process parameters development together with the microstructure uh, control to finalize, characterize the, the mechanical uh, properties or, or the, the properties of the process uh, materials. We have experienced processing um, the following metals. Um, we develop pure copper. And now we also, uh, we are working, we're starting to work uh, with, uh, with this uh, copper chromium uh, zirconium alloy. We have experience with uh, titanium alloys uh, for different sector, sector biomedical, uh, aerospace. Uh, also we work with uh, nickel-based alloys uh, with high hot cracking and susceptibility. And, um, we have also experience uh, in cobalt and different steel alloys. With polymers, we work with thermostable and resins, but also with thermoplastic uh, powder. We have uh, polyamide, uh, reinforced polyamide, and also uh, and now we are working with thermoplastic based uh, polypropylene. And also uh, we have experience uh, processing in composite of a stalling steel polymer in the sledge uh, technology. 
Then I will show you our uh, strategy for the qualification. Qualification uh, is um, it can be defined like uh, a method to ensure the additive manufacturing process, the combination of both the, the material and the technology. Um, to, to have the, this process uh, control in a repetitive uh, manner. So uh, our process uh, follows the um, disorder. We start with the material uh, control, then we evaluate if it's necessary to perform a hardware optimization. Then we continue with the parameter optimization controlling uh, the critical variables to produce the, the bill in the, the part. Also, we work in the, uh, in the optimization of the bill platform, the post-processes, and finally, the quality control of the, of the part. Um, this is a, an open route because in each point, maybe we need uh, going back uh, to improve some results um, in each step. So now I will show you the different steps um, follow and that I didn't follow uh, in the development and characterization of an advanced uh, metallic material. As a technological institute, uh, we carry out this activity um, for both sector, sector for industry and also um, in activities belong to, to research projects, national and European. So, and this is our, our different steps that we follow um, among the, the, the material development process. We start with the powder characterization. Then this uh, step one is optional. Maybe we need to, to perform this uh, hardware modification of the IT manufacturing system. Then we continue. Step two and step three are uh, really uh, close each one and the process parameter setup we are together with the density evaluation we will, is an iterative process so we will work in these two steps at the same time so at the at this point we will be able to develop a small dense samples as you can see here but if we want to to qualify the process to, to achieve a, a final part, a real part, uh, we need to go further um, in step four, five, and six. And these are uh, the study, um, study and fix uh, some critical variables of the process uh, in order to develop operational procedures. I will explain you an example um, later. Step five is the production of the specimens uh, to determine the property and the um, if the process is repetitive. And finally, uh, we finish with the development of uh, design guidelines to, to design a, a specific part. So we will see uh, each of these steps um, now. We, uh, we start with the powder characterization. It's very important in the additive manufacturing process to ensure a good quality of the production, uh, to pay attention to the starting material and the raw material properties. Because the final uh, part, uh, the properties of the final part will depend the pa on the power, but also the, the build to build consistency and also the reproducibility between different uh, additive manufacturing machines or, or maybe the, the production to achieve uh, components uh, free of uh, defect. So uh, results achieved in the final uh, part are influenced by uh, the following pattern characteristic. Morphology, size distribution, microstructure, chemical composition, and physical properties like density and flowability. So I will explain you very briefly uh, each, of, each of them. Morphology, uh, the spherical, uh, 
uh, shape is the optimum powder shape for the additive manufacturing process. In fact, uh, some irregularities in the powder grain uh, can lead to decrease the upper density and reduce the, um, the volume. So uh, you can see here now some examples. Uh, the morphology will also depend on the powder production method. Here you can see a copper powder produced by gas atom atomization. You can see that it's, uh, no, it's a, a less uh, spherical uh, powder shape in comparison with this uh, picture, which is a titanium 6 4 uh, the alloy titanium 6 4 um, produced by, by plasma atomization. So uh, different powder methods can lead to a more or less um, a spherical powder. So uh, we also uh, characterize um, the powder by non-destructive uh, testing. It's also possible to, to see some uh, irregularities, the effect, to quantify them. So we combine uh, conventional techniques together with uh, this one. The particle size distribution uh, is um, related with the efficiency of packing the powder. Uh, fine particle size tend to leave a small pores, uh, which are closed during sintering. However, an excess of fine particles reduce the flow properties. So you can see how each of them affects to, to the other one. Here you can see the, the usual powder uh, particle size distribution for the EBM technology and the laser powder bed fusion. Regarding microstructure, it's important to detect a powder defect, like gas porosity here in the first uh, picture. This is uh, titanium and powder, and you can see in the particles defect of uh, gas porosity or maybe it's necessary to control the microstructure. For example, here in, in copper powder, uh, you can see the second and third picture uh, are very different. Uh, in the second picture, the particle show a good microstructure suitable for, for the final, suitable for the, the process and the quality of the final part. But however, uh, this picture is copper particles with big grain boundary. You can see here, this is produced by the accumulation of the oxygen by the, um, in, the, in the grain boundary. This is uh, because of an, an increase in the oxygen content. And this is translated in lack of ductility in the final part. So this, is, this powder is not suitable for the additive manufacturing. Chemical composition uh, is also important. The purity of the powder is critically important. Uh, for example, the oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, as I said before, the oxygen increase uh, led to, to different microstructure. So the material properties will depend on the chemical composition of, of powder. So it's important also to check this, this uh, property. Flowability is directly related to the physical properties of the material and it has an influence uh, on the quality of the powder bed in these, uh, in these uh, technologies. Apparent density is a function of particle shape and the degree of the porosity in the particles. Here is an example. You can see some irregularities um, here we, we can find elongating uh, particles, also some satellites, uh, as, as well as a big uh, porous. So uh, the, uh, the apparent density is a function uh, of uh, this, uh, this type of irregularities. An additional aspect to, to consider um, are uh, 
health, safety, and environmental issues. We can uh, we have to characterize uh, these aspects. Also, the reusability of powder is important after the, the processing. And for example, the storage and aging of powders is really important. Here you can see um, the description, for example, of this. This is a, a, pure, a pure copper again. And you can see here the evolution of the powder uh, with the exposure at the environmental condition. You can see the difference of the color, and this is translated uh, in the in an in decrease of electrical conductivity of the, the final part. So you need to control that your powder does not um, is is uh, okay and is always in the in the same condition. Um, here, well, you can see some generally considerations. Uh, for example, metal powders for EVM usually are uh, sorry, less expensive uh, than the use than powder for laser powder rate fusion. This is be because um, they, they have a bigger particle size distribution. Um, but however, this big, uh, bigger particle size distribution influence on the final surface roughness, uh, which is rougher than the laser powder bed fusion. Uh, however, this uh, particle size distribution influence on the better ability to flow and to spread compared to the laser powder bed fusion. So you can see how a particle size distribution um, are related to, to the other um, to the other properties and can define the your powder for one technology or the other one. Uh, this uh, point uh, I said before that is optional, but for example, uh, you can perform a hardware modification uh, due to different reasons, such as maybe not enough amount of powder to carry out a standard production, or you are working with expensive powders. For example, in, in this case, I will uh, I show you this this picture because um, uh, we work. Uh, with uh, a, an expensive powder, a titanium aluminum uh, powder, and we want to perform a reduction in the in the build area of the EVM uh, technology. So uh, finally, we achieve um, a reduction up to fifty percent uh, of the usual amount of powder. So in this point maybe it's interesting depending on the material to process and the technology selected. How about the process parameter setup? Uh, it's usual to perform a small, uh, to manufacture a small uh, cues uh, for the process parameter uh, optimization. Uh, modifying, uh, for example, keeping contact uh, one parameter such as power and uh, modifying the sky, uh, scanner speed, uh, for example. Uh, in this way, you will obtain uh, different uh, cubes processing with different combination of uh, process parameters. Then uh, these uh, cubes will be characterized in terms of uh, density and um, we will obtain the, the correct uh, window of process parameters. Uh, here is a, an example for, this is a, an example of titanium. And here, uh, this is an example of the, we are starting to develop uh, now this material, copper zirconium, sorry, copper chromium zirconium, especially designed for nuclear fusion applications. Uh, so we are working in the development of uh, the process parameters. We are uh, trying to reach um, high density level, as well as we are improving uh, the surface quality, as you can see here, different, uh, different samples with different uh, conditions. So uh, steps two and three are uh, together. Um, we perform the evaluation 
uh, of um, this uh, together. The process parameters, build strategy, part orientation and border quality will influence in the, pres in the presence of typical defect. Uh, for example, uh, lack of fusion, uh, small pores, rats, inclusion, re and reducing residual stresses. So the process parameters development should be focused uh, on high on obtaining high density level but controlling also the, the, the microstructure and avoiding the volatilization of, of the, the elements for example here we have an example of a titanium aluminum alloy so uh, in this case we we control at the same time that the, we uh, wanted to reach a uh, high density levels, and you can see here the, the evolution of the density level. We perform the controlling of the, um, the microstructure and also the chemical composition, the analysis uh, of the chemical composition in order to uh, not volatilize the, the, the aluminum in this case. So at this point, um, now we will see the, follow, the following step related to the qualification uh, process for, for bigger parts. So uh, now uh, we need to study, uh, so a qualification method uh, should be designed according to technology, machine, and the material to use. So we have to define the whole change of the process from the powder to the final part. Then we have to identify, so identify all the critical parameters, develop uh, and study uh, to fix these critical parameters and control the, the value of them. I will show you a, an example to, to clarify this. Uh, for example, for, for titanium alloy, um, it's necessary, we have learned that uh, it's uh, mandatory control the, the evolution of the oxygen content along the different production. You can see here different uh, production and we need uh, to, to keep the blue line, which is uh, the oxygen control. The, we need to, to keep this blue line among the upper part uh, of the between the, the red lines, which are the, the limits uh, control. For example, here, uh, I show you our uh, procedure uh, for, uh, for titanium, for um, processing titanium alloy in UVM, uh, specifically in the ARCAM A2 system. So uh, we need to control in each production that the oxygen content, for example, for uh, grade five, uh, is below to, to, a, to, to this value, as well as, uh, for example, for grade 23 is below to 0 0.13. So we need to, to control this in, in every single uh, production in order to uh, control the, the oxygen uh, between these, these two lines. So a procedure for powder blending and handling has to be designed to, to ensure the, the, the oxygen content. Um, and also, uh, depending on the part to produce, um, maybe we, it's necessary also to, to perform some dimensional artifact to check also the, the deviation. Uh, once um, I will show you uh, now an example for titanium and for copper. Once we have uh, established our critical variables um, and control, we need to produce the specimens to determine the properties uh, and, know, and to know if, the, if we have a, a repetitive uh, process. So for example, here, to qualify the titanium um, processing by, by EBM. Uh, for example, uh, here in this build production, we, we have here our critical part 
and we need to control the oxygen content. We have here some small uh, testers, but also we need to, to control the mechanical behavior for this specific application. So we put also a mechanical tester in both uh, directions, in XY and also in, in Z direction. And uh, we also uh, check microstructure. So this, this is our uh, build production for qualification. Um, and after producing it, uh, we, we saw the results comparing with the reference, with the, the standard for this material. So we saw that in both directions, we obtain uh, the mechanical behavior was uh, superior to the established in the reference. So this is a way to control uh, and to qualify the, the process and this technology. Another example, for example, for, for pure copper, for high conductivity applications, also in the EVM technology, after, after design our uh, operational procedure, we have learned that uh, for this uh, application, uh, we need to control the, ma the material ductility it's important, so we put here a tester to, to analyze this, as well as the, the oxygen content um, and the dimensional control. So this is our uh, build production for, for qualifying um, the, the processing of uh, pure copper. And finally, uh, the last step is about the development of design guidelines. Uh, after that, uh, we need to, to know how a part should be, a final part should be properly designed without deforming. So uh, we process, we design artifacts, uh, for example, um, different uh, shapes, maybe we we'll say a bridge, with uh, different diameters in vertical holes. All of this is with the aim of uh, obtaining the, the part um, well processed without deforming and according to the uh, requirements. Finally, I want to show you a successful study case in the study, in the industry, sorry. Uh, this is uh, an induction coil, 3D printed uh, in pure copper. Uh, we developed the process for this application uh, for the company GH Induction, and the, the, the company patented this, this product. So it, this is a, a successful case where we start from the powder material, from the characterization, to uh, finally um, perform this, this kind of uh, the final part, which is now uh, working in, in, the, in the industry. And this is all. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, I will try to, to answer you. Thank you, Julia, for your interesting presentation. Uh, uh, we can witness that the application of uh, metal uh, additive manufacturing is really growing uh, very fast in recent years. So it's really important to know uh, how can you influence why, with the material properties, of course, on, on uh, the final properties of the, uh, the additive manufactured parts. As already uh, see that there is no question so far for you. And uh, okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. We need, and we are now, uh, we are really just on time. <laughs> we, we, are, we are now uh, at the last uh, presentation. Uh, it will come from Israt Kabir from, uh, from uh, University of Brunel. Uh, and uh, Israt will show us uh, an overview of functional graded additive manufacturing. I believe that. Uh, a lot of participants didn't hear anything about it. So probably it will be something uh, quite new for, uh, for, uh, for them. So uh, I will uh, 
leave the space for the Isra. Isra, please, can you can you proceed with, with your presentation? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Professor um, Godek, uh, for giving me the opportunity. So um, I'm going to share my screen uh, for the presentation. Um, my uh, voice narration is already embedded, so I'm going to play it for uh, 20 minutes, and then I'll be available for the discussion and question answer with my uh, colleagues. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Srat. So I think you, you can see my screen, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. It's yeah, thank you. All right, so let's start. Uh, th there is uh, no voice behind. Sorry, can 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 you hear? Uh, there is no voice. We cannot hear you. At least oh. I cannot hear you. Okay. Uh, all right. Yes, I can hear you, Israel. Okay, maybe something is with me. Um, can you hear my presentation? I cannot. No. Hi everyone, my name is Ismail Bhavanakati. I'm working as a research associate at Duna University. So can you hear now? Now, yes, but the quality is really poor. Oh, okay. All right. So I think, um, let me start. Um, okay, just a moment, please. Sorry for that technological issue. Yeah, we're still learning a lot of application, these platforms. Yeah, now, now, now I'm uh, sharing the screen with you. Okay. All right. So let me start now. Okay. So you can see my screen fully. I think it should be full screen, not present interview. Okay. All right. No problem. Maybe you should change it. So I'm starting finally. No, no it's okay. Thank it's you. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So um, it's moving. Why it's moving automatically? So um, thank you, um, and sorry for the <laughs> technological issue at the beginning. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the overview of functioning graded IoT manufacturing, and I'm Israt Kabir, uh, research assistant from Brunel University of London, working in uh, INIX Adam project. So I'm going to talk about uh, the progress on additive manufacturing and the application of additive manufacturing, which is the functioning graded additive manufacturing and the advances of FGM uh, along with the process chain, um, especially the design and modeling of FGM process. Um, the technology uh, used to produce functionally graded part using additive manufacturing 
and the types of FGM application with some future directions. So um, additive manufacturing in contrast with the subtractive manufacturing, um, it's added um, the material layer by layer uh, from um, 3D model uh, data. Um, and this is the additive manufacturing process chain. We all know about this, uh, which um, we also called the digital manufacturing. Uh, that means uh, the final part is going to produce from a computer aided design model, which transfer uh, uh, in a STL uh, file, which um, uh, convert the volumetric solid model to a surface model. And then um, using uh, some process, uh, for example, uh, um, uh, repairing uh, the model, um, slicing and um, nesting um, for the multiple parts to be built. Uh, we transfer the data from still STL uh, file to the machine uh, for final um, um, printing uh, part. And uh, after printing, we did some, uh, we do some post processing uh, to get the final product. There are uh, seven types of additive manufacturing process uh, from ISO and ASTM standard. And uh, uh, we, um, uh, with the, for, with the uh, few alteration in mechanism and system, we can call um, uh, all the process in various um, name uh, based on the type of uh, materials we are processing and type of mechanism we are uh, applying. Um, there are, uh, the additive manufacturing offers several advantages. Uh, for example, it uh, gives improved design functionality and performance. Uh, design freedom and also increased customization. Um, so with the help of topology optimization technology, um, it, it uh, offers um, um, building a, a different part with reduced weight and increased uh, strength. Um, and also it uh, reduces uh, the material wastage um, and improves sustainability. So um, there are uh, progress in uh, additive manufacturing technologies. So by redesigning uh, the final product um, and optimizing, uh, optimizing the building parameters, so you can use the additive technology for uh, multi-material uh, part production, which enhances the performance uh, by, by materials uh, gradation and uh, functionality. And it's also um, of open some windows to um, use diverse type of material such as glass and ceramics in, um, to build a different complex, uh, to build parts in, uh, with different complex shapes and um, forms. Um, such technological progression in additive manufacturing uh, in both hardware and software um, give, give uh, the opportunity to produce the functionally graded part um, through a process known as functionally graded additive manufacturing where um, voxel modeling is used for material uh, characteristics uh, to define the material characteristics within the 3D uh, solid model component. So functionally graded additive manufacturing, um, uh, it's a layer by layer fabrication process, which uh, involves um, the material um, um, gradation and um, properties variation within a one single part. So in contrast to the multiple um, multi-material composite, uh, functionally graded material uh, blends two or more material uh, gradually at the interface, which actually uh, resulting into a continuous change of the properties uh, such as uh, hardness, elastic modulus, ductility, um, opposed to the 
uh, sharp change uh, in case of multi-material composite. Um, so here uh, we can see that uh, using the voxels uh, modeling, which um, um, called 3D pixels uh, in case of function graded additive manufacturing, which capture uh, the information of um, the material in, uh, in each voxel volume, rather than just uh, it's a surface, um, uh, surface uh, modeling in case of conventional additive manufacturing, um, which um, makes the functionally graded additive uh, manufacturing more material-centric uh, process rather than uh, the sh shape-centric. And it gives a freedom of form uh, along with the composition for different materials and functionality of the final part. Um, so uh, in building function graded additive manufacturing part, uh, which, um, um, which actually um, mapping the performance requirements to the strategies of material uh, by allocation um, material data in every voxels uh, within a design component. So the advances of functionally graded additive manufacturing, uh, it, it um, gives a multi-material structure control over density material deposition. And um, it's a um, customization is uh, possible for um, different um, functionality in case of uh, different application. The types of functionally graded additive manufacturing, there are um, generally three types of functionally graded additive manufacturing. Uh, one uh, is homogeneous composition, which is made of a single material. And it's, uh, other is the heterogeneous composition, which uses the multi materials. In single material, functionally graded material, uh, functionally graded part, um, you can uh, produce the porosity gradient and also the microstructural gradient. Um, and in case of heterogeneous composition, you, um, you actually changes the chemical composition gradient to produce multi-material FGM part. And when in a part uh, you um, create the compositional gradient and also the density gradient, then it's called the comp combined comp composition function graded material. So the um, properties uh, of a function graded uh, part also um, depends on the dimension of the gradient vector. Uh, like uh, So uh, the gradation of properties or composition, uh, it can be um, applied in um, different uh, dimension. So in one dimension or two dimension or three dimension uh, by distributing material uniformly or in a spatial patterns. The FGM process chain consists of uh, mainly three stages, which is uh, geometry and material um, uh, modeling and the manufacturing uh, through additive manufacturing technologies and the post-processing. Um, in design and mat uh, material modeling states, uh, the three uh, parameter, which is uh, the product description and material description and manufacturing description are very important um, to decide the quality and accuracy of functional, functional uh, material uh, part to build. So um, in, 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 uh, to optimize uh, the relationship of design, the product and the allocation of material description, 
with the um, right uh, direction for manufacturing um, is depends on the appropriate uh, design and modeling application for uh, FGM using the, the right CAD tools and workflow. So for FGM uh, requires um, software tools permitting um, and the modification of composition of each material um, and the KAE software suitable to calculate the value of graded materials at specific location um, and appropriate file uh, pro pro appropriate file format which can um, uh, which can save and convert all the materials and design data to the machine. So likewise, this slide can show um, CAD modeling where you can, um, um, where the multiple material uh, is uh, designed using a voxel modeling uh, in the left side uh, with a soft material and hard material. And then uh, this modeling is embedded with a finite element analysis to calculate the graded material. Um, which uh, results uh, in the modification of uh, the final CAD model uh, with accurate um, material allocation and uh, giving the uh, correct property distribution. So um, for, for the voxel-based uh, modeling, the material values are assigned um, across the voxels volume uh, in each uh, geometry, uh, which uh, convert the information, um, uh, which convert the information for the manufacturing um, by, by using appropriate file format. This slide shows a VoxCAD a digital and open source uh, digital material simulator. It's a voxel based modeling and analysis software um, where you can, it's a, where uh, the voxel modeling can be possible with uh, assigning appropriate materials and, um, and, uh, and running the material simulation at the same time to check the, um, the design which is appropriate uh, to produce the function graded part. So you can uh, follow uh, this um, uh, YouTube um, channel to see that how this simulator works for voxel modeling and analysis to design a function graded part. So uh, like I said that um, to carry the de design and material information uh, to the machine uh, for appropriate uh, tool path uh, movement uh, to produce the fu function graded part. Um, the current STL file format is insufficient, uh, so um, which um, needs to improve with um, the characteristics with mixed and graded materials, material specifications, and uh, definition um, as composition of other materials. So there are a few file formats available, which is appropriate for um, function graded additive manufacturing, which is AMF and uh, fabricatable voxel file and 3MF. In manufacturing function graded additive technologies, um, the seven uh, kinds of additive technology can be utilized for um, production uh, in different type of function graded ad, uh, material uh, by altering um, some um, system uh, and principles of the main um, additive technology. For example, the material extrusions, um, uh, the common additive technology is, uh, it can be used um, by, uh, to produce a function graded part by changing deposition density and uh, deposition orientation through FDM uh, modeling uh, approach. 
And there is another uh, form uh, or derivative of material extrusion process, which is called the freeze form extrusion fabrication, uh, where um, instead of filament, the material paste is used um, in a multi-feeding uh, mechanism system to create uh, the multi-material uh, functionally graded part. So the powder bed fusion process where um, the, pro the part is uh, produced from uh, spreading the powder material um, in, in 0 0.1 millimeter thickness layer by layer approach. Uh, you can uh, also uh, produce the functionally graded material by correct powder delivery system. Um, like selective laser sintering can produce polymeric FGM um, by varying mechanical properties along the dimension and also by using correct powder delivery method. So selective laser sintering can produce a very complex shape of functionally graded material. Uh, selective laser melting process um, can uh, build a metallic functioning graded additive manufacturing um, where um, the metal powders are uh, melt selectively melted by using uh, heat external heat source. And uh, by using multiple number of feeders, it can continuously modify the composition um, of the deposited material. The directed energy deposition technique also available to repair and also create um, a high valued component uh, where uh, for creating um, and for um, making metallic function graded at the manufacturing part, a laser based uh, DED technique is used. Uh, for example, here uh, to be build um, uh, multiple layers um, uh, multi-material function graded part with uh, stainless steel and inconel. And the transition, uh, the transition zone can consist of a different composition of uh, both alloys by uh, controlling the feeding mechanism here. Lamination also can produce metallic um, function graded additive uh, manufacturing product. So by using uh, different metallic foils together um, and joining them by ultra ultrasonic welding system, uh, you can uh, produce uh, the function multifunctional uh, product using this uh, technique. Uh, the FGM could be produced by uh, adopting um, machining, a correct machining strategy and also including uh, the intermediate glue layers between the metallic foils. Uh, the material jetting and also uh, called polyjet technology um, can uh, produce a um, wide range of um, um, functionally uh, graded materials using their um, uh, using their own um, digital materials and, um, and there are a wide range of digital materials uh, available um, uh, pre-configured from the object studio and uh, polyjet studio software uh, which uh, can uh, have up to different, I mean, up to several uh, different material properties for um, a functionally graded part. Binder jetting uh, can also process a functionally graded uh, part um, yeah, for uh, the different application. So here uh, we can see the Z Corp machine uh, printer can uh, print uh, facial processes uh, for a human implant um, you know, using starch powder and a binder through this machine by appropriate color management for um, the 
and it's also personalization uh, can be um, achieved from this technique. Um, VAT photopolymerization um, using a switchable resin VATs um, and um, uh, and uh, digital and micro mirror device. So you can uh, produce uh, the multi-material function graded um, part using this technology, which is called mask image projection system. And also um, it, it, and it can produce a single uh, material, single uh, material homogeneous functioning uh, part uh, using the ceramic slurry in a photopolymeric resin using this technique. So, um, so um, the, the different uh, additive technology can be used to produce different kind of uh, function graded part by altering um, the parameters and op by optimizing the parameters. Uh, the key parameters uh, to build function graded part um, are geometry and material composition and the building strategies. Um, and we can see that um, a different uh, a functionality uh, uh, can be achieved uh, by um, altering the, param the specific parameters for uh, homogeneous function graded material and uh, heterogeneous function graded material. Function graded material, uh, function graded additive uh, manufacturing um, attracts many novel and existing um, applications in different uh, fields of engineering. Um, you can see then aerospace, automotive, bio implant, uh, defense, electrical, and also tooling, um, sports, etc. Although um, the fun, uh, it, uh, okay, uh, this is a, oh yeah, yeah, this is a, a bio um, breakthrough of a functionally uh, graded additive manufacturing part, which is a bioadaptable dental implant. And you can see that um, in this implant, uh, two type of hard and soft material can be um, built in, um, in one single step and also using different lattice structure uh, to, in, uh, to achieve the porosity of this um, dental implant. And um, this is a design and production uh, process chain for, um, for this dental implant. Uh, it's followed uh, by a reverse engineering process so although uh, the function graded active manufacturing is uh, promising a better solution to many manufacturing industries, um, uh, yet there is still um, need to go far away um, for, for, to develop um, the different aspects of this uh, technology. For example, the improving design guidelines, uh, uh, developing a better computer aided uh, software, uh, and uh, the material allocation uh, mechanism, and also um, a new uh, machine concepts to um, produce a different functionally graded uh, part for different materials and improving the post-processing um, area of this um, application to get the quality full uh, product. So, Thank you so much for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, please uh, stay with us. Thanks. Thank you, Seth, for a very interesting presentation. And uh, I believe that uh, there is, uh, for a lot of our participants, uh, a new, new things in, in your presentation that they have heard for the first time. Uh, so, all of you are now free to, to put a question to Israt or, or Julia. If there is no question, I can maybe uh, make one, uh, one uh, comment uh, regarding uh, 
not only uh, those last presentation, but also uh, the whole workshop. Uh, there are a lot of improvements, a lot of developments in the field of additive manufacturing, but I think that the real step forward in this area will be development of new materials. So the material area of materials will open a really new, new area of uh, possible applications and maybe uh, new technologies in, in this area. So therefore, I think that uh, this topic of uh, uh, materials for the additive manufacturing is uh, really quite important and we can expect uh, I should say maybe some revolutionary findings on, on this area in the future. Today we can see uh, this uh, uh, development in, in medical field, also in, in food industry, in construction. Uh, so uh, probably in the future we can expect uh, from this side even more. Uh, of course, new materials will open a new uh, uh, applications and probably um, motivate uh, the development of new technologies. This is just my my uh, opinion that will happen in the future. Do you have every, anything to, to say? Maybe some of the panelists or the presenters? If not, thank you very much for your contribution today. Uh, it was really quite interesting. And uh, I think that uh, this will motivate a lot of our uh, listeners today to, to think about uh, materials, uh, design for additive manufacturing, uh, advanced, the, the functional grade additive manufacturing, metallic additive manufacturing with metallic materials. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, there will be some interest for cooperation in the future with all of us. Uh, to all of presenters, thank you a lot once again for your presentations. It was very, it, it, it were very uh, interesting and, and very inspired. So, uh, inspirational, <laughs> inspired, inspirational. So, uh, with this, we can conclude this workshop and uh, we will see next week a uh, few times. First on workshop on the Monday and then a summer school, which is also open to all of the potential participants uh, uh, on Thursday. Uh, we will send uh, the invitation to, to all interested parties. Thank you again for all of you. Bye. Thank see you. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.